Hello, Facebook Live. This is Mark Brumley from Ignatius Press, and I'm here with Father David McConey, SJ, editor of Homiletic and Pastoral Review magazine, and Jesuit extraordinaire. He's a priest. He's a Jesuit priest. He's a theology professor uh, at St. Louis University and an editor and the author or co-author with uh, Carl Olson of this book called To Be the Children of God. Uh, which is a Catholic theology of human deification. He's got other books that he's the author of edit or editor of, and we're going to get into that today. Welcome, Father David. How are you? Thanks. Thanks for having me on the program for the first time, Mark. Appreciate it. Yeah, very, very good. So homiletic and past review. I know some of our uh, viewers will be familiar with that publication, but others may not be. So tell us, what is homiletic and past review? Well, Homiletic and Pastor Review, www.hprweb.com. It's the oldest standing pastoral uh, journal in English-speaking world, I believe, going back to 1900. And uh, Ignatius Press received that under the editorship of, was it Father Ken Baker was the first? Father Ken Baker. Who in 2010 decided to pass it on. And both Father Baker and I did theology studies and were ordained deacons in Innsbruck at the University of Innsbruck, the Jesuit college there. So I got to know him when he came back for some alumni events. And I remember yeah, I, one day we were walking and he kind of tripped on some cobblestone. I said, you better watch it. Uh, you don't have a replacement for editorship of HPR. And he said, do you want it one day? I said, I'd love it. So years later, uh, Father Fessio called and asked and I went through my superiors and received permission to edit this journal. So you said you both did your diactal studies there, but of course you did them some years apart. Right. Uh, I think uh, Father Baker was there before uh, the great Ronners and uh, Jungmanns. And so, but I was there uh, in the early uh, 2000s. By the way, speaking of Father Baker and HPR and, and notables uh, in theology, I've been looking around. We have back issues of HPR at the office. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find this somewhere. But recently, as you know, and other people, the world knows, Carl, uh, Carl Hans Kung passed away. He did, yes, Swiss and, theologian. Uh, that's right. And there's a famous HPR article published in the early 70s. Uh, and it was not t a typical HPR article in a certain sense. When Hans Kung came out and uh, rejected the dogma of papal infallibility, infamously, HPR ran an article by Carl Rahner. Now, Carl Rahner was not someone who typically HPR would have run, but Rahner wrote uh, an article that actually criticized Kung for his position. And it's a kind of a big article, famous article. And I got a couple of emails from people and messages on Facebook and so on from people saying, I couldn't find that article. Could I look for it? So I'm going, I'm actually going to go down into the basement of Ignatius Press and pull out that article and I'll send you it to you. You'll see if you, see if you want to run it again. I would, that'd be an amazing article. Rahner sometimes gets uh, misunderstood. Uh, I think he did push the boundaries at the end of his life with some essays on, on um, women's ordination and some of the church's moral teachings. But one line he said early on has meant so much to me. He said, the Christian of the 21st century will be a mystic or he won't be at all. That's he right. understood that the world was getting much louder, much more chaotic, much more adverse to the gospel. And that we who are living day-to-day -day Christian lives have to become mystics of the mundane. We can't just think Sunday obligation is gonna feed our souls. It's no longer enough to show up once a week. We need to pray every day, need to avail ourselves of the sacraments more often. And I think Rahner was right on that score for sure. It's harder and harder to, to be a nominal Christian or a nominal Catholic. I mean, it can still be done if you're very dedicated to it, but it's it's a ch challenge because, as you say, just keeping uh, continuing to participate in the life of faith requires some measure of commitment, and it's not as uh, socially acceptable as it used to be. Right, and socially expected. I mean, I think a lot of church deals um, were encountered were, were done for business deals for social uh, acceptance and whatnot. Today, it's very countercultural. And this is our opportunity to shine like light in the darkness. And so when people talk about closing churches or people leaving, it is sad on that natural level. But on the supernatural level, a little bit like Good Friday, I think the Lord is doing something much more mysterious and mystical. Okay. So you talked about HPR being uh, the, the oldest uh, pastoral journal of, of its kind. 
and I think it was started around 1900. So homiletic and pastoral. I want to take a moment to talk about those two words. What does homiletic mean? Well, good question. So originally the uh, journal started to help young priests and deacons uh, form homilies. They were homily helps. They were readings for that coming Sunday. This is all before uh, the webs, you know, uh, the USCCB's website, before missiles were too uh, readily available, before the Magnificat and all these things. So it was a it was a week by week uh, preparation for preaching, and that's what homiletics means that art of crafting God's word in an applicable, attractive way for those in the pew. Okay, so that's the homiletic part of it, and then pastoral, of course. And then pastoral, the another name I think would be good theology, just helping people understand what can sometimes be abstract truths that are difficult to understand, but made in a way in such a way that they make a difference in our lives. To be pastoral means to apply truth to reality. And that's where I think HPR does a really nice job helping people understand. We run articles from the Nicene Council to breastfeeding to mass online to how, how to uh, help with garden tips. And we've had it all. <laughs> the so, garden tips, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, theology, you know, the word of God has application to our lives. So, of exactly. Course. So, homiletic and pastoral review. And uh, I, I, we talked about homiletic and pastoral. What about the review side of things? Uh, you know, there, there are a number of regular uh, book reviews in HPR that many people love. They just love that aspect of HPR. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, every week I get a few books from top-notch Catholic publishing houses, and I place them on the books received page, and people write in under their ex expertise and say, hey, I could review that for you. And so we run about 10 reviews every seven weeks or so. There's a young man up in uh, Portland, Maine, Chris Suzdak. I'll give him a shout out. He's been a wonderful reviewer for us and very, uh, he's a canon lawyer. So his mind's much more orderly and, and, and clearer than mine. So, but yeah, it's a good way of, instead of buying the book to see if you want or not to read the reviews of the uh, upcoming Catholic works and uh, go from there. I mean, it may sound a little geeky and then perhaps it's a little geeky, but reviews are tremendously helpful to people. You know, mm -hmm. deciding whether they want to whether they want to buy a book or read a book, uh, get a sense of what's going on out there in the larger theological universe. I, I find them extremely helpful. I don't always find the reviews on places like Amazon all that helpful because, uh, you, you know, you, you different things come into play when those reviews are written, and so you don't always know how reliable they are. But HPR reviews are very very helpful. So online, that, online, the yeah. only reviews you know are actually true are the bad ones. <laughs> the good ones are probably true, but they can also be written by the boss's daughter. That's At HPR, true. we're not selling books. We're not trying to push anything. We're just reviewing them as we see them. And let's face it, any reviewer is going to have a limited perspective, but at least what we put out there, I think, helps somewhat. Right. So in addition to articles on homiletics and doctrine and uh, uh, pastoral issues, HPR also has a regular Q&A. We do. Father Brian Milady, great Dominican. Uh, people write in all the time with vexing questions from parish life, from spiritual life, and he, he answers them. And uh, every now and then I'll offer an editorial, but I find that I would rather have the voices that are really connected um, getting out there. We run seven essays, seven slots every two weeks. So 14 articles a month, which we weren't able to do in the print edition. We were stuck to maybe five or six essays a month. So HPR then, where people can get HPR, how do they get it? They go to www.hprweb.com and you can sign up to get the uh, bi-monthly email and it leads you to the link. And it's free and it's accessible and uh, it, hopefully it's helpful. We yeah, have so readers from all over the world. We get about 26,000 hits every month. And most of those are in English speaking countries, a lot in South Africa, a lot in Australia. And our number one place are the homilies. So we run homilies for every Sunday and every major feast day each month. And you can see a lot of people clicking on those. And I imagine they're either bored lay people or, or <laughs> rushed uh, clerics who have to come up with a homily quickly. Bored lay people. Um, it may sound, although we don't, we do want to emphasize the fact that HPR uh, has a, obviously it's, it's oriented towards serving priests and deacons. So the clergy, and I know there are bishops who read HPR and all of that, but at the same time, it's, it's something that's valuable and useful for lay people. So. Sure. Sure. I imagine most of our readers are lay people looking for good, solid, undiluted Catholic theology. 
And there are many out there. This is just a little more accessible and I think a little more diverse than being just scripture or being just moral. It, it covers the panoply of Catholic living. You know, a lot of, a lot of people may say, well, I um, appreciate the fact that, you know, there's something out there for priests and deacons and for people that are lay people that are interested in this high flutin theology or the, the peculiarities of, uh, pastoral ministry in the parish, but, you know, I'm just trying to know God better and grow in my life of prayer. What do you have to offer for me? Excellent. Well, we often, we have, um, we have some lay mystics. Um, Carolyn Humphreys writes articles every, every few weeks, every few months, I should say, on prayer and mystical union. We have uh, an article by Father Basil Cole, a Dominican, coming up on how to achieve that even during the time of Corona and, and at-home masses. So really the ultimate goal of any homiletic or pastoral care is that sense of union. And that is affected only through our prayer and sacramental worship. So almost every article will have something there to help the Christian, whether it be lay or, or religious or clerical, grow in that kind of conformity to Christ. The book you held up by Carl Olson and myself, that's precisely why we wanted to get at that out there. The ultimate goal of Christianity is to become one with Christ. It's not to keep the rules it's not to have a clear conscience and all the things that are good, but ultimately those will flow only from that divine conformity. All right. So people can check out hprweb.com and they can read articles by various folks, including yourself occasionally writing the editorial and uh, things of that sort. We want to encourage people to do that. Father, uh, you know, to, to move out. Well, actually, I don't know if we're moving out or moving in. I mean, you, we're speaking more generally about pastoral theology and so on, you're a theology professor, but you're a theology professor, and, and, a, and you have a relatively specialized area, patristics. I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about that for a moment. Um, but I also like you to reflect on uh, the disconnect sometimes that is perceived to exist and may actually exist between theology as it's taught, say, in a college level or even, even graduate level, and people's life, you know, people's actual faith life. So before you tackle that question, tell us what patristics is. Well, my area of study is the early church, pater meaning father. So it's the early church fathers, maybe between the year 100 and 700. That's the people with whom I deal most of the days. And so I find this of central importance because Christianity is an ongoing conversation. C.S. Lewis said you can't join a conversation at 11 p.m. intelligently that, that started at 8 p.m. You have That's to right. know what has been said. And one of the problems of a lot of theology today is it just jumps right in with, with important uh, social and cultural issues, but forgets that there's a whole conversation having occurred before that. So the understanding of Christ's two natures, three persons, one substance for the Trinity, all these things are non-negotiables uh, that have to be incorporated in any common uh, updating of any kind of faith question. So, Well, all right. So um, that's patristics. What about this issue of the apparent and sometimes real disconnect between what happens in a, say, a theology classroom right. and people's actual lives and, and trying to live out their faith? That's a very good question. The university theology enterprise is one I think that's still being crafted. It's relatively new. Usually theology was taught to only uh, upcoming clerics or religious, but now in most Catholic schools, you have to take an intro to theology class. And it's understandable that we have such a diverse array of students. It's, it's almost impossible to teach that course with any kind of one cookie cutter syllabus or method. And so the critique might be that my student is not being fed. My son or daughter is not receiving the faith that they received in high school. Um, okay. Uh, but there's another sense in which I don't know if the university's job is to play catch up because a lot of kids come uh, to St. Louis University with really good intentions, really good minds. And for the first time, they've heard the word incarnation, the word Trinity. So we do have to spend some time doing that catechetical groundwork, but I think it would be doing a disservice if we stayed there. Uh, my, my class, for example, we start with C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. And it's amazing to hear how the kids read that text, what they bring to it, what they don't know. And then we go into Augustine's Confessions printed by Ignatius Press. Uh, and then we read some Pope Benedict on social issues, on liturgy. Uh, and then we do a few other kind of current things like uh, sexual morality and social justice. And we read Nostra Aetate on world religions. So I really uh, push a lot of the understanding that the Catholic faith is so full and so active that it overflows into any other part of your life. 
And there are some kids that get it. And there are some kids that are still wondering, but at least they get to hear, I think, the central truths of the faith. We spent a whole week, actually two weeks on the creed, um, which to a lot of them is new. So. Hmm, interesting. Well, one of the, so part of the disconnect there is you have students who, who come to take theology at a collegiate level who aren't adequately prepared. That uh, uh, brings to mind uh, the story that Bishop Barron tells about, I think it was his niece, who was in these AP classes in high school and reading, you know, fairly advanced literature and all that. But when it came to theology, you know, it was, it was sort of pablum. And he said, well, if you took toward, if you uh, took the kind of theology course, uh, you know, at the level of theology that you're taking in these other subjects, you'd be reading the Summa, right? Yeah. And that's not necessarily to say that high school kids should be reading the Summa, but if you're going to tr treat the subject matter of literature or mathematics or whatever, uh, at that level and say, AP, this is what we expect from, from people in those courses, then we should expect something akin to that right. in, you know, in, in theology in high school. And yet so often that's just not the case. So part of the reason why theology at the college level may seem irrelevant to students is that they're not adequately prepared to, to undertake theological studies in the way that we presume they're prepared to study, you know, math or science or literature when they come exactly. to college. I mean, one of the casualties of the enlightenment was sacred doctrine that we used to teach theology in a certain um, tier and, and ordered structure. You started with proof of the existence of God. You went to the Trinity, you went to creation, you went to the human person, all the ways that the church and the sacraments bring you back to God, the four last things. But, Ever since the Enlightenment, and we're talking a couple hundred years now, most religions have been reduced to experience, to feelings. Um, we've forgotten that it's the queen of all the sciences, which in a modern university sounds actually kind of laughable because real science is done down to the med school. And, right. um, and that's right, it is. But boy, if, if, if a Jesuit vision was one that God has found in all things, then theology really should inform all those other classes. And you run against the practical reality of having 15 weeks. You don't have four years like you would when Thomas was teaching the Summa. So a couple of years ago, I started the Catholic Studies Center here, which Catholic Studies is a maybe 30-year-old kind of new academic discipline in which all the higher questions of economics and business and medicine and art and music, they all come together to look, to, to be looked at through the Catholic lens. And it's a really neat kind of holistic kaleidoscope of what the Catholic vision is for the human person, for the world. And one of the things these students really appreciate is coming to wrestle with the difference between a career and a vocation. I mean, wow. we don't talk about it usually, but we have a class called Catholicism and the Good Life. And ultimately the question is, what is your vocation and how will you discern that? Because they don't say it, but most of them just really want happy marriages. Um, they want to be productive members of a community. And if we, if we train them only for a job, that's going to be harder in coming. So St. Louis's University, I think, is doing a really good job helping them understand what a vocation is. The Jesuit uh, spiritual exercises, they all make a retreat, and they're given the tools to help understand where God is speaking to them in their very, very concrete experiences. Well, even on a human level, I mean, you, you talk about the distinction between vocation and, and uh, you know, so career, training someone for a job. Well, there's a very good chance if someone is trained for a job at co in college that within a few years, that training is going to be obsolete. Somebody's got to be equipped to, to be a lifelong learner. Right. And that's part of a, a wider human vocation. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to take it a step further and say at a Catholic institution, not only do you have that wider human vocation to be aware of, but uh, we're going to talk about a deeper human vocation, which is the, you know, the call to communion with God and the ordering of one's life in relation to God. It's amazing to me that so seldom, I, you know, I come from, an academic background. I was a school teacher for a number of years and so on. And it's amazing to me how so many Catholic institutions, whether we're talking about the collegiate level or we're talking even at the level of high school, so many Catholic institutions will talk a good talk about Catholic values and identity. And yet they're really, when you look at what they actually do, as opposed to what they say, they're really about um, making sure people succeed or at least have a good shot at succeeding as far as careers go and things of that sort. Not that there's anything wrong with having a successful career, but that kind of, uh, we're going to call it vocational training in a different sense that you're talking about, uh, it, it doesn't seem to happen, at least doesn't seem to happen consistently 
right. so many of our Catholic institutions. I think a student has to be very intentional in searching for that. And I, I might be overly optimistic, but I, I believe that at most Catholic schools, they'll be able to find that if that's what they're looking for. These students who really want to know, how should I pray? What's the connection between my spiritual life and my practical life? I do find there are community centers, uh, Newman centers, there are focused missionaries. There's a lot of good things happening. What you can't do these days is drop your student off and think he or she's going to receive the best Catholic education possible. They might if they look for it, but it's not going to be something automatically given. So you t you mentioned the Catholic Center there. Uh, talk a little bit more about that because I, you know, first of all, I'm from St. Louis. I love St. Right. Louis. And so, uh, and I used to hang out. As, I didn't go to St. Louis University for college. I, I went to University of Missouri, St. Louis, but I had a lot of friends there and hung out with a lot of people at, at SLU. Uh, so a lot of affection uh, for SLU. And in fact, my wife and I were part of, uh, this is post-graduation, we, we were part of a thing called the Young Catholic Forum back in the 1980s, which was uh, headquartered at St. Louis University. So a lot of affection there. So tell us about what goes on at, at your uh, Catholic Center there. Well, we had an empty building on campus and I asked for permission to create the space for not just Catholic students, that's what we call it, Catholic studies, Catholic in terms of universal. It'd be a place of study. It would be a place where our degree was housed. It would be uh, a place with a chapel and a library. Uh, we have a beautiful lecture hall now and a couple of seminar rooms and offices. And it's a place where students come basically to, I find this generation, the most important thing to them is community, knowing they belong, knowing they have a safe place to go, knowing they can ask questions. We have two full days of Eucharistic adoration here. We have 168 kids, I think, on that email list. So we're filling up hours, you know, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And one of the neat things for me is to see how public safety, the, the officers come down every hour on the hour throughout the early morning and day and make sure the kids get in and out okay. And it's really heartening to see uh, a public safety officer praying in the chapel for a few minutes before he accompanies someone home or something. Uh, so there's that going on in the liturgical life. And then there's the academic life. We just had a new major approved, which is 30 hours, 15 hours in Catholic studies, and then 15 others in affiliate related subjects. So hopefully it'll be a great double major for someone who comes in pre-med, pre-law, education, nursing, business, but who also wants the I would say the best of the liberal arts to, uh, to complement that. I tell my students, you have two goals when you leave here in four years, to get a job and to become more interesting. And uh, <laughs> I hope they become more interesting. You know, so we're pushing Dante, we're pushing Hopkins, we're pushing Flannery O'Connor. We have a reading group right now with uh, Dostoevsky. So things that most of us, when we get older, isn't it true, Mark? We look and say, what was I doing all during college? How come I didn't read that then? Right. right. And that's what we're trying to fill in that gap. Now, some of this you can't avoid. It's a question of maturity and so on. But I, I tell the story of, of, of having reread uh, the Iliad, you know, mm. as, as some, you know, in my 50s, as someone who who was a history major, among other things, in uh, college and have, you know, read the, the Iliad in college and so on. And it's an amazing thing how reading it many years later, you have such a wealth of experience. It's almost like a different book. You know, yeah. but if I had never had the experience of having read it in college, I would have no basis of comparison. Mm -hmm. And and thus, I, I you know, I, I feel like I would have been, uh, you know, not as I'm not a great person now, but I would have been an inferior person uh, not having read the Iliad in college and inferior still not having reread it in life experience. Right. So I think Lewis it's really a, a lifelong thing. Lewis says a classic is a book you can't read once. So that's right. Mark Twain says a classic is a book you sh you tell everyone you read, but you haven't. That's um, right. So, I mean, that is part of the challenge of these days when we're re-examining the foundations of Western culture. What is a canon? What are the more important works? So we can't read everything. And so this notion that maybe there is a canon by which we judge other literature, beginning with Homer, um, these are these are important questions. Well, I, you know, Father, it's it's great that you're there at St. Louis University, that you've got the Catholic. Uh, I studies. love St. Louis University, I have to admit. Yeah, it's great that you're there. And uh, we really thank you for taking the time to be with us today to talk about homiletic pastor review and to talk about Catholic education, including your work there at the Catholic Studies Center. Thanks for being with us, Father. Thank you for having me, Mark, and blessings on all your viewers.